this is the point in time where you get to ask questions of the speakers, give comments to the speakers, and sort of give your ideas or thoughts on how we could change how we look at environmental impacts, maybe follow-ups that need to be done or you could envision could be done as it relates to human interaction on marine mammals, or how would you add things to sort of make a bigger picture from the different points that we've looked at today. So let's start with questions for the speakers. We can rock. God, never been so fabulous. Well, I've got, oh, thanks, Jeff. Well, for, for Keith, you know, you were talking about the contaminant levels, and you know, that, that Southern California is off the charts. And, um, and I knew that we had a, a problem in terms of DDT because of the Montrose plant, but, but you were talking about, you know, things that are more recent than DDT. And so, so why is it, I mean, we shouldn't be any worse than other urban areas. Why are we so bad? Well, actually, I think I disagree. I, mean, I think we should be. Just the, the density of urbanization in Southern California coastal zone is huge. I mean, where else in the country do you see that? Oh, I don't know. Houston, you know, something like that. You know, in other words, there are, you can think of areas where, I mean, well, in that particular case in the Gulf, because of all of the industry, you know, right along the shore related to oil and that kind of thing. But, but we're, why are we so bad? Well, uh, I, I get it. I think it, it, it boils down to the amount of hard surface and people we have in Southern California. Because it's not just wastewater that we're talking about, it's storm water. And you get atmospheric input as well. So the sum, the sum total of that going into our coastal area, it, it is a, it, it's a big load. And some of the data that supports that is NOAA um, also does a muscle watch study. And they did a pilot study on these same flame retardants uh, back in 06, two years. Two, you know, muscle watch is every two years. And they pretty much showed a, a very strong correlation between urban density or population density and the levels of PBs in these simple muscles, which don't move around. So, um, Houston, I, you know, I, I don't know that there's data, you know, for a population that moves up and down that coast. I, I don't know that. But if there is, I would expect, you know, levels to be pretty high as well. Well, just sort of as a follow-on, at, at uh, UC and Scripps, we spent several million bucks lately putting in a really uh, extensive uh, storm drain, you know, water uh, treatment and runoff system. And so are, is, that, is that indicative of what's happening all over the place? I mean, will are there measures in effect now that are capturing more of that sort of runoff that will make things better? Or, or you know, is it, is it gonna be a problem 10 years from now? Well, uh, no, I and mean, those are some of the solutions for stormwater that, that we're starting to implement and think about. Um, where we are now is trying to determine the balance of load coming in from stormwater and wastewater and, and sort of other non-point sources that are very are harder to control by MS, atmospheric input. So those kinds of controls are, are, you know, will be effective if that is the main source of, of loading coming into our coastal areas. Was that your question? Or? Well, you know, if you were to predict, if we do nothing, where are we going to be in 10 years, or what do we need to do, you know, if that's not going to fix it? I mean, it seems like we have a problem. We can't be 10 times higher than everybody else and not be unhappy about it, right? So what are we going to do? Yeah, about? it's definitely on the radar, you know, it, it, and perception, it, it, is, it is a problem because it's high. Uh, what are we going to do about it? I think we need to get to that science to show that, or to tell us, you know, what sort of impacts that we can expect. If it's immunosuppression with all this other mixture of chemicals and, you know, or other environmental factors. It doesn't have to be chemicals, right? They can be additive or, or build up each other. Then, you know, we need to put restrictions on stormwater input. Uh, and, and that all goes through, goes back to monitoring, you know, how much is going in, uh, rel uh, the relative contribution of these sources. Well, not to, I don't want to dominate this too much, but, but it seems like we've failed somehow in communicating this to the public. I mean, I, even I, I mean, I had a sense that it was bad, but you know, the figure you showed, if you say, you know, to the Southern California public, you guys are, or, you know, we collectively 
because I guess you know I'm as responsible as anybody else that you know we've contaminated our ocean and that these sentinel animals and, and obviously the whole ecosystem is contaminated by this and and that something needs to be done. There's no public profile. There's no public perception that this is the case. And, and you know how does that change? Uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know that I can. I'll, I'll open it up, but but you're you're correct. I think my my own viewpoint of what humans value is is what we eat. It's not necessarily what marine mammals eat. So that's part of the equation is is getting education on the environment as opposed to education about what influences us personally. And that's the first step. And then we can start picking the the most important stressors to that marine environment, maybe one by one or, or together. I don't I don't know how. How that goes with the public. Does anybody else? I have a bit of a comment and then a follow on. Um, the first comment is perhaps an opportunity is it, what's the goal for our finished product from this workshop? Should it be something where we've got a, a press release going out saying, hey, here's what's going on and here's some of the new stuff that's presented and the questions and challenges to Southern California? Because one of the nice things about this workshop is the local focus. And I think that local focus gives an op opportunity both to highlight what we're doing locally, but also to demonstrate in a unique way the problems that we're facing and dealing with. To address that sort of in a bigger picture, though, Keith, I think you raised a great sort of question in my mind when we talked about what was happening with the stranding networks and evaluating stranded animal samples. With your broad brush toxicant screen, the, hey, is there a toxin there screen? Don't you like that? What does that cost? What would one sample cost to run? Well, I think you probably know the, uh, the general answer to that is, you know, we, for example, Nate worked on this one lover sample probably for the last eight months. And there's good reason for that. He's working out the methods so that we can apply it sure. more efficiently. But it, it's expensive. It's probably, I don't know, Nate, can we put a dollar amount on that one sample right now? But the cost will come down. It's, it's thousands of dollars, just put it that way. And right now we're using it as a, a discovery and a tool to hone down on, on the questions. Uh, whether it becomes a routine thing, I, you know, I'm not sure about that. And that's why we're touting this more uh, biological approach where you, you know, there's a whole series of in vitro bioassays that are being touted to get to a response a molecular response or a response to a certain chemical. These are all in vitro type screens. Uh, there's a huge link to try to uh, make, make that jump to an uh, organism or even a population effect, huge. But that's, that's where we need to start to get a screen for not just one chemical, but all these chemicals or all these classes of chemicals. Sure. I, I want to respond to, because I think you, you said something pretty important about you know, an outcome from this, right? And, and so, you know, that, that there be some set of goals, and you know, maybe the first goal would be to raise public awareness, right? And then, then there's things we need to know to actually figure out how to solve the problem. And then there's, you know, actually having a plan and pushing somebody, you know, somebody with power to, to implement the plan. And, um, and, and I mean, I, I think that would be, a really great outcome, you know, if, if some group like this, and, and maybe in a way, in terms of the ocean, we do have some, we would get the attention of the public by using these kind of sentinel species. In other words, if you said, there's a big problem with horseshoe crabs, you know, we got to do something, you know, you're not going to get the same level of attention if you say, you know, we've, we've poisoned our dolphins. And, and mother dolphins, when they give birth, the first baby, will die, right? I mean, I, I right. may be being too sure. dramatic, but this, it could be this is the outcome of, of having these blues. So, so I, I think, you know, we are in a position to, to make an impact. And, and, you know, and I want to make sure that what you said, you know, gets captured, that, that out of this, instead of just talking about it, we should have some kind of plan. I love that. Good job. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll play the devil's advocate here, though, because another point that I picked up out of your talk was 
that we don't know, really know what the effect is. And so I, I think if you go to the press and you say, wow, there's all these pollutants in these animals, but you don't know what the effect is, then you run the risk of crying wolf for something that isn't necessarily the biggest threat that these animals face. And uh, I think what would be another possible good outcome would be actually, and I remember we discussed this somewhat last year, trying to put our heads together to come up with some collaborative studies and some target organisms that would allow us to get it magnitude. And, and I, as I recall, last year we were talking about coastal terciops and doing a comparison onshore offshore. So I think a lot of those people are in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, some folks have. We have to, we've got Nick here, and, and that's what I was trying to get at is we, we do need to to work toward a, a response type answer, not just a chemistry answer. Uh, two reasons: public, you know, they don't they don't know about these chemicals. They they might know that they or think that they're bad. <coughs> you put it in the context of a response or something that affects biology, then it's probably a little more uh, digestible for them. And I, I just want to make a note about Sarah's talk because I, I you know NOAA has an oceans and human health initiative. And I think the reason for this, the underlying reason for this, is because people care about human health, they'll take action. And if you can tie marine sentinels to human health, uh, I think you'll get more bang for your buck. I think that's pretty much the reason why they went that route. I, I could be wrong. Okay. Yeah, I was just uh, kind of um, thinking about the uh, highlight what Barb just said, and that, that is that this Coastal Tercyops project in particular is useful not just for a comparison for inshore and offshore, but you know we will have we have PBDE levels in bottlenose from the same area, the same region, which are again extraordinarily high, just like they were for sea lions. But you have this ability through the monitoring program that, that's there in photo ID to track survival, so you could then link you know your PBDE levels to survival. You can. You know, if we got a little bit more aggressive with biopsy, that has its own down side effect. But you could then also measure when animals were getting pregnant and if they had an associated calf and what their PBDE levels were before that period of time, before they, they would have their first pregnancy. And you can see if it, what John is really saying, are they delaying their, basically their successful first birth. Um, and I think it is, it's a fairly good model project to start with because it's one of the few places we both have survival and reproduction, and we can look at one of the, the known effects, which would be a delay of successful reproduction. So I do think that would be, be a good, really good place to start. And it is, happens to be in an area that Daniel said was going to be particularly sensitive or has been particularly sensitive to climate change um, right along that coastal strip. But, but I, and there are still other factors, but I do think it would be a great and a great place to, to start. I'll just, I'll just support that. I think the inshore bottom nose is, I mean, that's what we're trying to get our hands on first. I think that, that's where you start. I agree with that. Danielle? So um, I found interesting your, um, or Keith's response to John about um, the, uh, the urbanization as being the direct cause of all these high levels of and you should definitely take my words as a grain of salt, but we do know that um, because of the atmospheric circulation, there's a lot of stuff that's coming from China and being, being blown across the Pacific. So um, part of these attributions about what are these the actual, so, so we have the problem, but you know, what is the source? And you know, we may be assuming that's a local phenomenon, but it might be combining from, from coming from somewhere else, and I don't have the specific information as to whether this could be, this is true or not, but it's, it's certainly a possibility. It's a remote source of, of uh, those, those contaminants. But would you see elevated levels all along the west coast if it were coming from afar? I don't know. I would have to look into that. Uh, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly testable, you know, something I could be looked into, and certainly there would be a, a place where it would be more impacted than others because of the way the winds are coming. Even from like Mexico, have you taken any samples from water there? Is, um, is San Diego so close? 
Not that I want to not blame you. Well, no, no, no. The, the Minivet study was very much focused on strandings in, in the two counties here. Now, whether they're ranging to Mexico, uh, you know, you got to leave that to a Minivet expert. Right. I think the bottlenose probably range. Well, there's been some Mexico data done, and the sea lions down there are much cleaner compared to here. Oh. They're probably not like Mexico and then comes up here. Yeah, I was just thinking even close, like, you know, like that, just right down. And, and John's correct. I mean, the, even the, we had comparisons of sea lions here to the Central Coast, and, you know, we're talking factor of five or six difference. It's not one and a half. So I think urbanization, I mean, I think it's pretty well documented that you've got high urban density. You're going to bump up that baseline even from atmospheric. I, that, that's just my feeling. Now, from sort of the medical point of view, I kind of chime in. Remember, we're not talking about every toxin um, and every contaminant when we say urbanization is highly associated with elevations and contaminants. That's sort of a broad brush stroke, but certainly we've got some that are more associated with other actions, agents, populations, or areas. So you can't just say, oh, you know, it, it goes across the board. And not only does it not go across the board for what's in the environment, remember the way different species get exposed to these contaminants has a lot to do with their lifestyle, inshore versus offshore, their feeding preferences, what they choose to eat and where in the trophic levels they're choosing to eat. So it's not as simple as, wow, we've got tons of toxins off of LA less off San Diego, clearly, because it's a better place to live. But other than that... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, on our three species, we saw sea lions, you know, significantly higher than the, the other two species. And I think that just tell, reflects what you just said. Sea lions are very cosmopolitan, and they, at least from my observation, they like to hang out where people are and mooch. <laughs> Along the lines of, of changing um, as things change based on what you eat. Danielle, you talked a little bit about um, increasing severity of El Ninos. Has anyone done work to say what species are more impacted perhaps than others with these more dramatic climate changes that we may be seeing? You're asking specifically about marine mammals, correct? You go crazy. <laughs> 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 well, um, Basically, yeah, El Nino is actually a really good um, sort of a case study of what could happen under climate change scenarios because the next thing we have to a warming event. With El Nino, of course, you go back to what you'd call average normal, but um, the ecosystem and community structure changes that you see during El Nino might be analogous because you get thermocline deepening and uh, decrease in primary production that are expected to take place during uh, global warming. So it just depends on where you are. For instance, uh, studies that have documented replacement of species, of cetacean species, uh, up along the west coast, like Monterey Bay or uh, around Santa Catalina, <coughs> Santa Catalina Island. So um, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, generally speaking, you'd see a decline in. in so the, the logic schooling fishes, sardines, and anchovies, whatnot, and maybe an increase in um, certain squid species and so on. But it's, it's just so complex because the, 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 the big black box that we always end up running into or against is that we don't really know what uh, the prey is very well. And that's what really needs to be investigated. So at any one, any one time, we don't know, you know if you're, what your species of interest is really eating. We have a general sense, okay, well, if it's more fish, it's sort of more squid, but even within that, it may be that it takes, takes uh, advantage of certain squid species during certain times of the year, and other species in other times of the year, and that we really don't have much of a handle on. So it's, as I said, it's a big black box. Um, and um, it just really depends on where you are. Uh, I, I think, I hope one of the messages that I was trying to convey is that all these environmental signals that we're seeing have a different spatial manifestation as well. So in some areas, they manifest themselves very strongly, and in some areas are, are weaker. Are, they're expected to change much, much less. So going back to your question as to uh, we're, going to, we're predicting to see 
um, shifts and changes. There have been, up to this point, a couple of studies predicting what could happen um, globally or in large scales to the cetacean distribution under climate change scenarios. And uh, both studies, have, one of them is in press right now, and the other one was published by um, Hal Whitehead and colleagues a couple years ago. And what they uh, concluded is that um, diversity, uh, cetacean diversity is at present time higher near the tropics and that diversity would sort of move toward the mid-latitudes and decrease in the tropics. But these are also very general, um, still very crude, very coarse studies because uh, we, um, we don't have really good parameters to make better predictions um, about what would happen. But it is generally understood that we might uh, see a decline in diversity in, in the tropical species, increases in the mid-latitudes, and of course, shift ranges. Beyond that, it's just wild speculation. As, as everything with the climate is really a lot of speculation going on. Sarah, and then. Yeah, I'll just add that I, I think, uh, you know, based on some of the past El Nino events, there are certain signals that come through in the stranding data, and admittedly, those are animals that basically can't cope or are coping poorly with the, the change. Um, so animals that are having trouble finding food um, at that strand, but I mean, just generally there's a, a northern first the old pulse that kind of uh, precedes almost everything and then it kind of sweeps through uh, the other species. And that's, I say it's anecdotal because I, to my knowledge at least it hasn't really been quantitatively looked at, so that would be a great project if anybody's looking for something. Um, and then, you know, also just kind of some of those same uh, range shifts or, or, you know, your warm water animals being seen further north uh, during some of those years. <coughs> so, again, there's, there's at least some things that could probably be teased out a little bit more. Um, this, sorry, Jay. <laughs> uh, this is for, for Daniel, but kind of for a lot of people in this room. Um, you had said something, and, and the Get, getting back to that black box, um, you had pointed out the fact that a lot of the modeling that we do right now is kind of distribution and it's based on parameters, you know, sea surface temperature and, and things like that. But you pointed out the fact that we really need to get to the mechanisms, um, and that's why I'm putting this to a lot of other people in this room that do this kind of modeling. Um, that the mechanisms, I think, are part of that black box. But how do we start to address those mechanisms to really? model and predict, which is I think ultimately where we want to get with this, potential species responses to, you know, climate change or increased contaminant loads or whatever. I mean, that black box I think is the key, but, but when you say mechanisms, what are some ideas of how we get there? Well, I think the answer has to do with um, looking at the ecosystem as a whole. And by that I mean, in our immediate case, would be the California current and even the Southern California component of it as, as a unit, and um, having a handle on what the ecosystem structure of that system is. And that means understanding what the composition of phytoplankton groups are, and zooplankton, and, and fish, and so on, and then how those change over time. And that's what allows us to formulate hypotheses as to, okay, well, we, we have a record of temperature change or nutrient change, and we, we're seeing the response in the trop tropic levels, which are direct responses to that. Whereas when you start getting to the apex predators, they're integrating so much that it's just really difficult to, to, to point out what's going on. But you can certainly formulate those hypotheses, and then the models would be based on, on those <coughs> hypotheses that the mechanism would be, the, would be then if you are um, hypothesizing that the thermocline is becoming sh uh, shallower and that, that there's, there's less of one, for instance, with that will come um, by the plankton community that's not based on diatoms anymore, and therefore you may get less sardine production and so on, and you would be getting maybe more predators that are, um, for instance, squid or uh, gelatinous, what, whatever, you know. And then, based on that, you may you may start making some predictions of your under, based on your understanding of how the ecosystem is structured. And you know, once you start getting going global, it, it just then becomes really difficult because um, there's just so much diversity 
But just going back to the point, I think uh, going on an ecosystem by ecosystem level is how I would get at it, at least. I'm sure that other people may have other ideas on how to go about it. Danielle, before we go to Jay's question, does Goose play a potential part in that ecosystem monitoring? Yeah, um, you might recall there was a slide uh, called uh, that, that was about uh, PACUS, so that's the uh, Pacific uh, Coastal Observation, Ocean Observation System. And uh, PACUS is the, the NOAA arm of that uh, observation system, which is basically just uh, people trying to integrate all these efforts that are being conducted more or less separately. And the emphasis in NOAA is uh, directly for ecosystem uh, monitoring. So it's just not physical or it's just not chemical or something, but it's actually, uh, it's going toward the ecosystem-based management uh, doctrine that is being pushed forward at this point as the way to, to go forward. So specifically NOAA uh, is going along the lines of uh, a whole ecosystem monitoring. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make the point that um, it's very likely that the effects of global climate change are going to have much more impact on the pinnipeds than on the cetaceans. Um, cetacean habitat is fluid, and there's every reason to think that they're going to follow the, the viable habitat, and there will still be viable habitat for most niches that are, are out there. But pinnipeds are tied to their natal rookeries. and um, particularly otoriates, have to be able to forage in the near vicinity of their natal rookeries. And that, that puts them at much greater risk due, due to climate change. Um, and in particular, an otoriate that's at the southern extent of the range of the species, that would be at the greatest risk. And that's obviously the, the northern fur seal that Sarah mentioned. So I think that if we wanted to come up with a sentinel species that would be indicative of climate change, that, that's the one we should be concentrating on, the, the northern fur seal at San Miguel Island. Um, and then the other species that will be most impacted are the ice-dependent species. And um, we don't usually think of Southern California as housing very many ice-dependent species, but the gray whale is clearly one. Sure. Sure. Okay. Actually, while Jay was just talking, I did think animals with restricted range are going to have a difficult time <coughs> this point about the horizon. And I would think the question actually to, to Jay and Barb really is, is what about Bikita? They have a very small range. I hate to talk about environment and Bikita because that's clearly not their number one issue. But um, is there any idea about what's going to happen with climate models and, and this really narrow niche that Bikita live in? The, the water in the, already reaches 30, 34 degrees in the summertime in Bikita habitat. You have to wonder how much warmer could they possibly stand. Yeah, yeah, that's, so anyway, that would be another, that would be another uh, word, uh, group of animals to be very, very concerned about with uh, global change, or climate change. Isn't that an issue more of the fact that the Colorado has been dammed? I'm not going to that. Oh, well, let's not go. No, no, no. <laughs> we need to all turn off our drinking. Bosses and let the river flow to restore their habitat. Think about the contaminants you would just flush right in. <laughs> yeah, I know Barb does not want to go with <laughs> Was there a raised hand over here somewhere? Dr. Bolts had one. I have one point. Um, I'd like to make a plug for the point that Nick made is that there's some real value to figuring out what's going on with individual animals and individual groups over periods of time. With cetaceans, we have a tendency to figure that they can go anywhere and do anything. But remember that it isn't just what their prey base is, they also have to deal with each other. And there's at least one area that I can think of where there's a little bit of a sign that there might have been some competitive exclusion going on, which is the southern mesonite killer whales, because not all pods were affected equally when the Chinook crashed. So, and we're not even looking for those kinds of influences yet, and I think we should be. I had a, something related to, to that, and uh, also to Nick's uh, comment about restricted habitats, and you hit it right on the nail because uh, at the last uh, IWC workshop, uh, 
one of the main recommendations was actually to undertake a global review. I don't know what the IWC does is recommend ass assessments to global reviews, that kind of stuff. And one of the things that was specifically commissioned to a, to a task group was to conduct a global review of restricted habitats. Where are they? Because um, we are aware of them, but if we start looking on a global scale, we may get to draw comparisons and see um, are they being forced by the same kinds of mechanisms and, and what's, how species use them. So that's certainly one of the hot topics on impacts of climate change, specifically restricted ranges and submarine canyons and areas of very high diversity, yeah. so sort of hotspots of biodiversity. And um, I had something else to say about what you just said. <laughs> so I, I may come back to that because right now I'm, I'm blanking out. Yeah, I want to put in another plug, and I think we did this last year as well for using pinnipeds as model organisms because it's so much easier to follow the, well, to manipulate the animals and to follow the history of individuals. And you have way more opportunities to see bird birds than you do in a little tiny population of coastal hobnose dolphins, even though I think that's very important and they're a different model organism, you're still not going to get very many first birds, whereas you could go out to Channel Island where they're branding pinnipeds and you would get hundreds of first birds in a single year and you could do a real <coughs> So I think for looking at questions like pollutants, they're a really good model organism and for the reasons that Jay said, it's nice to be, you know, getting a lot of baseline information. It's, it's just, you know, you can learn a lot more, a lot faster. Now that said, uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is, and I, and I sort of noted that in these maps, there's all this emphasis on the, on the coast. Um, and I think that comes in large part from how those models are weighted. But I think the animals that are going to be the most difficult and to monitor and therefore the most likely to fall through the cracks are the ones that don't come to the coast. Um, and I, I, don't, I guess I don't have as much faith that the organisms will be able to adapt. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, but that same paper that you showed, Daniel, about that Chung did, um, I saw him give a talk and he showed the projection of market squid in the Southern California Bight and it basically had no market squid in the Southern California Bight in the next, like after 30 years. Well, that would be a pretty big change if you were a grandpa's or, a, you know, I mean, anybody who's a squid eater out there. Um, have, have there, are those models sort of accepted on, in terms of what's going to happen with the squid? And basically, they were just, as you say, everything was sort of shifting up to the north. And if the animals all just shift up to the north, that might be okay. But if you're a Southern California bike grampus, and there's already a group of grampus that are occupying Central California, maybe that's not such a good option for you. But I don't know, is there, is, are there more predictions on what's happening to the squid? Not that, that I'm aware of. Um, squid especially are just so hard to, to get good data for. So, um, but what you, the point you're making is really valid in that um, it's, it's not just that, well, they're just shipped wherever the prey are, because um, there, there is a lot of competitive exclusion going on, and um, it may be that even though they theoretically could shift, if the, the new place is already occupied by um, another group or another population, they may not be able to occupy it anyway. And um, um, going back to what I had forgotten before was, um, uh, Randy Wells has con conducted this long-term study uh, of uh, coastal tarships in, in Florida, and that is the one place where they are, of course, able to, to ma manipulate the animals. So it's kind of an exception rather than... Uh, uh, so um, they, they do have evidence that... Because um, they're looking at climate impacts at this point, and they do have evidence that when um, there have been climate events uh, transient climate events in, in Florida, the the population that resides there, even even if even if it's because of phylloptery or or if or if it's just because of 
the, uh, the adjacent baits are already occupied by other populations. The, the local population just won't move out and occupy another range, even though in theory they could, to escape perhaps, for instance, warming waters or, or something. And another scenario was, for instance, the, the oil spill, where they said, well, what happens is if the oil com comes this way, would they be able to maybe move into a different bay that does not get affected by the oil spill? And they had um, information that they would not be their natal sort of home range for, for uh, such a coastally tight species. Perhaps a more oceanic species might do something different. But clearly, there's just so many different modes of, of ranging for the different species and sort of behavioral aspects that we just really don't have a handle on. Uh, competition, it, it, it's either conspecific or interspecific that we don't really know much about. As a matter of fact, I wanted to make the point that with cetaceans, the huge gap is that we know almost nothing about their social interactions and particularly uh, aggressive interactions among animals. We can't see it. It all happens fast and underwater. So this is something that I think is going to turn out to be a big factor as we watch them trying to cope with these changes. So how would you deal with that? How would you see it? Well, I think one is kind of an attitude adjustment on all of our parts, realizing that, yeah, you're not going to be able to get thousands of animals if you're watching individuals, but by golly, there's something to be said for tracking small numbers over long periods of time. This has been enormously valuable in studying primates, particularly large primates. So it's something that we need to just start being the, the, the Jane Goodall for the dolphin or the whatever, whatever it might happen to be. And Randy Wells is a classic example, but you know perhaps something along this coast would be valuable as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> are you are you at zero looking at all at different types of vocalizations? Like, is that a way to be able to look at that? For example, an aggressive vocalization, jaw popping, anything that you could hear with the hydrophone. Um, we are slowly but surely homing in on those kinds of issues. Uh, there are challenges in both types of environments in making sure that you can follow an exchange over time mm -hmm. because of the issues with localizing sounds. And, but, but the short answer is, yeah, this is of interest. Okay. The other thing that's of interest is that a lot of times these guys have very, very tight social systems. You know, tight to the point where I agree that some of the strategies may be the responsible uh, you know, um, their navigation systems going awry, but I think sometimes when they strand, it's simply because they can't be separated from one another. Now, you have to ask yourself, what makes that drive so strong? Why would any animal be willing to do that and have that strong of a drive? Why is it so important to be a cohesive social unit? And that kind of gets you into this whole competitive issue. Well, I want to try to inject a sense of urgency, and not just because we only have eight minutes of <laughs> cocktails, yeah. right? <laughs> but the, and the, the sense of urgency is that, so let's say collectively that we have this sense that, that there are problems, you know, problems now, problems coming, you know, and, it, and you know, we are the ones that have a best the window on what's happening with cetaceans in Southern California. I mean, the people in this room, are, we have to bring the guys next door over too. But, but so, so now here's this opportunity, you know, because we're sitting here and, you know, in a sense of collaboration and cooperation and, and trying to move forward. And, you know, and, it, and if in seven minutes now we just go and have a drink and try to forget it all, that's a, that's a mistake, right? So. How are we going to go from, from where we're sitting? And I think Barb is right that if we just try to issue a press release that says, you know, the sky is falling, that doesn't work. But, but you know, the sky may be falling. And, and so we need to somehow have a venue. And, you know, Pacific Life gave us this little window. And I, I feel like it, it's, it's closing. And we need to somehow figure out how we're going to go from here to, to, to do something. Because when I go to, other venues, like you go to the IWC and it's all caught up in politics, right? I've never been to the IUCN, but you know I suspect it's the same kind of global, you know, arm wrestling contest. If you go to the Marine Mammal Society meetings, you know they're they're bigger sort of national issues. And so here we are. I mean, when all of these kind of issues come down, 
to some local place in some particular you know piece of water and, and animals and that's where you know we can have an impact so so, so it's I'm I'm distressed because I feel this window of opportunity is closing on us well let's take it we've got six minutes left <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody to go tick tock tick tock um, and what John is saying is, you've been given an opportunity, don't further it away. And I agree with you completely. Um, I see the concern, hey, we don't want to cry wolf, but I would actually say, if we can say something from this workshop, and then say, and here's the potential means to address it, I'm not sure that's crying wolf. I think that's stating a problem, and then taking the folks in the room, who should be the ones who can come up with a solution, and saying, here's a potential proposed solution. I realize no one's got a pot of gold behind the Diaz, but... Well, even if maybe we could just agree that we're going to have some forum to continue a discussion and try to have some, you know, milestones or deadlines or something. Now... You know, I mean, I, I think there should be a sense of urgency. I mean, we've just seen, for instance, that the toxics are ten times higher than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, what do we need to see before we get, you know, um, concerned? So, from this workshop, we can come up with these are our concerns, and these are potential solutions. I think, how much time do we have? I've lost 10 you seconds. More, you, have, you have as much time as you want. There's oh. wine, wine being served, and you don't need to drink it. So. <laughs> OK, well, that's not funny. <laughs> but, but, oh, yes, we did. But Tennyson, in our schedule, tomorrow afternoon, how much time do we have for the whole group to come together it's in a, sort of the, what's your rehash? Where an, are we? an hour and a half for the four. Um, for the four panels to kind of to summarize what happened and then a half hour conclusion. So, so you, you might also just take, you know, if you gathered uh, volunteers, names of people that wanted to keep talking about this, you know, and have some phone conference calls and start talking about strategies or where you want to go or what you want to get to. I'm, I just don't think you're going to do it in six minutes or four minutes now, but, but you can keep doing it. Right. Well, but Bob, I think John's point is we actually have an unusual potential pulpit using you shamelessly. Huh. Um, <laughs> is it correct? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, it just, it, yeah, I think that to make progress on any of these things, there has to be some local focus. Do right? we have and, tables where the wine is, or is it all stand up? <laughs> there, it, it's, at, it's in the tent, so it's where we had dinner, so you can sit down at the tables and there's belly bars as well. So what might be an effective way to address this, because I don't disagree with your point at all, is poor Anne <laughs> is the person sort of in charge of capturing what have we talked about, what have we brought up, and I'll, buy, I'll bring you all the beverages and snacks you want. <laughs> um, if folks can get with Anne and do a 10-minute sit-down, this is what we talked about that I think is important. This is how we potentially could address it. And there's a few people in this room that I know are part of the community and the solution that haven't had the opportunity to talk um, during this session. So this would be your perfect opportunity to sit down and say, hey, here's what I do. Here's how it relates back to what we talked about in the workshop discussion session. And completely quietly, without anyone else seeing what your thoughts and desires are, you can get your position into Anne's no. statement so that when tomorrow afternoon we get together we've got something to launch from rather than just sort of a here's what we talked about. Does that sound like an effective way to get there? Well the big piece of what John's talking about is not necessarily speaking to the choir here in the room but finding ways to make this real for the people in the outside world. And we, we deal with this a lot where we are but I'm sure a lot of you do too so what's the best way of kind of emoting and communicating with people who aren't marine mammalogists. That's it. Actually, before we go, I'd like to know from everyone in the room, what's the best way to disseminate the, the workshop results? Have you heard? Yeah. Yeah. If you're trying to get to the public, you know, uh, that's probably out of my realm. If you're trying to get to decision makers, it's not necessary. It's a different it's a different venue altogether. So, so that, that's the first thing. Are you targeting the public? Or are you targeting the decision making? I, I, I think, think we just need a forum to continue the discussion. Okay. You know, it's just we've just started, and and now it's over. But so we need to build some structure where we can continue and not come back next year or two years from now, whenever you know Bob 
pour some more wine right. and say, oh, here we are. It's the same as it was like two years ago. Well, it, but I think the encouragement uh, to Barbara Jay's point of, hey, didn't we talk about this last year, is oftentimes it takes more than a year to sort of get things together and get things moving. So I'm actually not discouraged that we talked about this last year. I'm encouraged that we're still talking about it because I think this means we've got the foundation to take the next step, which is why I think you are right. It's time now to take the next step. Last year, we were just sort of figuring out who had shoes on. Danielle, did you want Would it be of help to recommend identifying two projects? And they actually would go right along the lines of expertise that are here, but uh, identifying a couple of um, key species or central species that Barbara and Jay both, both mentioned. One pinnipid, one cetacean like the coastal bottlenose dolphins. And um, providing a forum to, um, as a community, identify what are the things that need to be done to um, tease out those problems in these two species and come up with better answers to um, whether we can predict or identify or uh, resolve these problems. And, you know, just, just kind of um, push them along with the idea that um, these are projects that are um, designed with the specific goal of answering certain, ans uh, certain, certain, certain questions. And what I mean is that up to this point, a lot of the evidence we have comes from all kinds of different studies that are out there, and we're trying to put it together. Uh, but we, of course, have a lot of gaps because it was never intended to answer the question or the problem that we're faced right now. But from this point forward, we can start by identifying, we know the problems, we can identify a couple of projects to say, okay, let's try to uh, come up with, identify sources of funding, and how would be implemented and developed? Would that be a helpful way to, to, to move forward with I, a couple of projects? I think it would, and I think that's the kind of information that would be important to make sure Anne has captured to sort of address things. I know Greg has probably done things not unlike this on the East Coast. I, Tell us what you're thinking. I just want to really endorse that. I think uh, John's urgency, we have a couple <coughs> suggestions about specific populations. Mm -hmm. uh, it's finite, you've got two of them. Uh, you've got, you can begin ca capturing long-term uh, time series, which you said is an important thing to do. And the people in the other room are talking about data sharing. So now you need co uh, collaboration and cooperation to do that. And so your first recommendation, your first audience would be in the other room. And you say, okay, what do you guys come up with? We need to figure out how to work together on a couple specific questions in the finite study. Good point. Really good point. So you're not actually excused. So you have homework. <laughs> the homework from this session is you need to, with beverage in hand, um, sort of contemplate what would be the most reasonable step forward and check in with Anne and say, this is where I think we are. The good thing is Anne's a living creature, so she can say, here's what we have right now and where we are. Um, and we can sort of move this forward. We'll get together so you're not overwhelmed by tomorrow afternoon and sort of see if we can have a cohesive presentation for when the group comes together and we try to put together things like what are the new toys we have for evaluating animals. I'd actually like to bring in you know, the opportunities Sarah Wilkin presents with things from the Stranding Animal Network. My God, I know people have things in their freezers from 20 years ago. I'm scared of some of those samples, but I know that they're there. Um, and that being the case, I think we've got some resources that we don't use routinely that can help to contribute to some of these questions and evaluating the problems. Does that sound like a reasonable plan and getting us where we want to be, not just sitting in drinking Bob's wine? Well, well the other thing that might happen is, I think this is picking up on what Greg just said, is when at the wrap up on tomorrow okay. afternoon, you know, when all four groups stand up, we start to see sort of cross interests, and then it gets put together into some real project. Correct. So, so maybe I'm a little less distressed if we have that window to try again. <laughs> I like when you're distressed. It's kind of fun. Far. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me throw one more wrinkle in there, though. I, I think it would be good. I mean, it's nice to just pick up two species that are relatively practical, <coughs> and that's a very important component. But if you're worried about shipping noise and ocean noise, I wouldn't choose either of those, mm -hmm. right? So you've, you've covered, you know, if you're worried about runoff pollutants and if you're worried about, you know, I mean, 
if you list out the threats and you list the species, you're going to find that there are still going to be some <coughs> serious threats that we should be addressing and seeing how they're affecting marine mammals writ large in Southern California that are not going to be met by those two species. So I think it would be good to, before you settle on anything, take a broader look and make sure that of the things that you think might be real serious threats, but we don't really know the magnitude and we want to know the magnitude, is it covered by this? And, and I'm betting that there will be some gaps in there. I think that's not a, that's not a wrinkle. It's actually a good enhancement. And what I recommend is, because I don't think two species deal with all the issues, because if they did, my God, I suck because I'm not dealing with those two. Um, but what's important is if we can keep both the focus as well as sort of the optional considerations that we can't ignore as part of our sort of overall what we bring to the table tomorrow, we'll be in a better position. Yeah. Okay. But when I made my endorsement of what Daniel said was I thought we were only talking about contaminant loads and uh, global climate change because that's what <coughs> we've heard discussed in here in the last hour and a half. But I'm not saying it has to be limited to that, but well, uh, but the, it depends the, the on shipping and the noise issue is something that we've discussed okay. several times. It depends today. on what the question is. And what what I think you're going to find, and one of the things I found as we we're organizing this workshop, is that we, believe it or not, we define the questions. And so if we take, you know, everyone picks their two species, and wouldn't it be fabulous if it's all Coastal terciops? Is it coastal terciops? Let's use coastal terciops and northern fur seals. To heck with Guadalupe. <laughs> Breaking my heart. Anyway, um, but that doesn't address every question. And that goes to Barb's wrinkle, which is, hey now, if we've got the solution, that's fabulous, but have we really identified the problem? And I think our goal here is to identify the problem, identify a solution that works, and make sure we're not ignoring the big picture. So a generic question could be, what is the impact of factor X on the health or of X pop Y population? I mean, is that generic enough for this group? Because you've got X number of species and you've got three potential stressors that I've heard, contaminants, um, noise, and then the influence of climate change, which could be... We've talked about disease, uh, uh, yeah. okay. uh, harmful right. so, algal blooms. So you need a matrix. There's, there's a lot of components we haven't addressed. Carrie? I mean, I think this is just kind of what's coming up now, is it seems to me that there needs to be a summary of what are the environmental and human impact <coughs> concentrations in Southern California? What are they? What do we know? What do we don't know? And what species do they impact? I mean, you have to have a sense of what's going on here first before we can choose. It, one of the things we talked about last year was if we just focus on the animals, we lose the concept of the environment and all the other impacts on them. So the biotoxins and algae are a great example. So if you just look at animals, you don't really focus on a really big threat to their health. We need to start somewhere. And I think if you sit down with Anne and say, Anne, this is what I think the panel today said that the threats to Southern California marine mammals are, I bet nine other people in this group will give those same threats. And so we'll have consensus on, here's what we think some of the big threats are. It's not all the threats. And believe me, we talked about having probably 10 other people on this panel. And a big part of it was we had to be selective so that we could have a reasonable sized group, but we couldn't include everything. It's too big of a problem. To John's point, if we continue saying it's too big of a problem without moving forward, we're never going to go anywhere. So I don't think there's any problem saying this is the problem we're addressing, but acknowledging that it's not the only problem. Well, I'll make another suggestion that I, I hope will make it easier, and that is when, and I'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow, when these biological review teams have to turn out a status for this species as a petition for listing, we put together these big threat tables. Mm -hmm. And so the threat tables have already been made up. You know, so you can just pull it from probably from Southern Resident Killer Well. I, mean, I would think they would probably have experienced every threat that we would be experiencing in the Southern California body. And so you can just start with that table 
as the here's all of the risk factors, and then you have all the species that are in the Southern California body in the columns. And I think another really important thing to document is just all the places where we have no clue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have no clue because there's so many species that are not going to strand. I mean, if they were having a very serious issue with demonic acid and it happened to be a, a pelagic species, you're probably not going to see it. And so I think it's really important. I mean, there's, there's one thing of designing a study that is going to get at the mechanism. And that's why you're, you need tractable critters. I mean, you aren't going to work with those guys. But there's another thing saying, you know, just documenting that this could be a much bigger problem than we know about because we don't know any of this. So I think that it's worth doing a thing with all the threats, all the species, and then picking your target ones out of the out of the table. And I don't I don't think it would be like you say I don't think it would be a hugely onerous task, way more than we can do a line. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. I have that with me so I can look at the one You mean the set of yeah. things and we just did another one for false killer whales. We did one for humpback right? We baby heart stable. Well thank you everyone. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Tension.